old problems in new ways. Can I have a show of hands? Who's actually heard of social innovation before the conference today? Yeah, that's fantastic. That's great. Great. We hear a lot in the political agenda about innovation. We need to be innovative, we need to do this. But social innovation is really focusing specifically on what we need to do to address some of the, the social problems that I've just alluded to. People often ask me for a clear definition of social innovation and it's really hard to find one. Um, I describe it as both a mindset and a set of strategies that look for new ways for dealing with old problems. It's about developing a new paradigm, <coughs> a new way of looking at the world, and a new way of, pro of approaching some of the issues that we face. So warning, we're, we're looking at a new paradigm today, I hope. So as I say, it's a mindset, it's a way of, of approaching the world, and we'll talk a bit more about that today, and it's a set of strategies, and I'm going to put you through one of those key strategies, which is the human-centered design thinking approach. So social innovation looks for new solutions to our most deeply entrenched and challenging issues. Because let's face it, most of the easy problems have been solved. Mostly what we've got left now are some of those really, really big, deep, systemic issues that we really need to think very carefully about how we're going to address them. I love this quote by Albert Einstein. We cannot solve the problems with the same thinking that we use to create them. The problems that we're dealing with existed because a certain mindset at that time existed. The problems between the gap between Indigenous people and the rest of the country exist because of certain ways that people thought and behaved and acted in the past. Um, there's been an allusion already to the stolen generation. People at that time believed that they were doing the right thing. So if we still continue that thinking and then try to solve the problem with that same approach, we're not going to come up with viable answers. So we need to develop new ways of approaching those issues. One of the key things that social innovation does is look at problem solving differently. So rather than seeing a problem, it looks to find the opportunity. What are the opportunities here that we've missed? For instance, what are the opportunities that we've missed over the past centuries of white occupation in Australia to actually learn from Indigenous people? You know, we're finding out more and more about bush remedies, you know, plants that we've overlooked that we're now thinking might have amazing medicinal qualities. There are all these things that we haven't seen before, and if we took that opportunity to actually engage more fully with Indigenous elders and people who have expertise, we would learn so much more. The key question that social innovation asks is, how might we? And that phrase is what we're going to hear a lot today. And even that simple change of our language, how might we? How might we opens up opportunities? How might we opens us up to exploring ideas and looking at different ways? of approaching things. So how might we solve some of the problems? I'd like to give one example of what I think is a really amazing social innovation that uh, took place in Paraguay. Paraguay is one of those countries, like many countries throughout the world, that has deeply entrenched endemic poverty. And like many countries throughout the world, numerous NGOs have gone in decade after decade bringing in money and expertise and only making a really tiny dent in, in the issue of poverty. Foundacion Paraguay, I said that terrible I apologise, <laughs> um, went in with this idea that one of the key things that we've never done in all that time with engaging with people in poverty is to ask them what they need and what they want to make their lives differently. And so often we in the West in particular are very guilty of deciding how we think things should be improved and going in and, and delivering what we think is the right thing. So using technology, they gave iPads to various families living in poverty and they asked them to rank themselves where they felt they were suffering from the greatest uh, lack of things, where they were experiencing poverty most acutely. And it's a quite a complex uh, questionnaire that they went through, it would include things like, do you have a bathroom, do you have a toilet, 
Is the toilet indoors or outdoors? Is it flushed? Is it shared with other people? Do you regularly go hungry? Are you able to go to school? Do you have shoes to wear? Those sorts of questions. They were then able to collate all that information and then the NGOs were able to look at, okay, in this particular village, most of those kids aren't going to school because they don't have clothes to wear to school or they don't have shoes to wear. So if we actually give the kids some shoes, then they might be able to go to school. So rather than worrying about what do we need to do differently at school to bring the kids in, we actually enable them to go there. Then they were able to say to each other as a network of NGOs, how do we distribute our resources more effectively? So rather than 10 or 15 different uh, NGOs working in one particular village, they were able to separate out, they were able to consolidate, work together, and then they could work more effectively right across the country. What that also did was it enabled the people experiencing poverty to become empowered. They then started to understand what they needed to change their lives and they knew how to ask for what they needed rather than having to be the grateful recipients of whatever was given to them. And there's all <coughs> sorts of really innovative ways of approaching things that I think social innovation really stands for. And this pro project has had such an incredible impact that it's now being supported by the government and there's, there are measurable improvements right across the board with education levels, with the eradication of poverty, with health and all those sorts of issues. So the key in a social innovation strategy I want to uh, put you through the process of and gather the skills of today is human-centered design thinking. So the objective today is to equip you with a great understanding of what human-centred design thinking is. We're going to use that process to actually address an issue. I want to put you through that process so that you can start to build your competencies in using this approach to problem solve. Um, and we're going to look to ways to find social innovation uh, solutions to some of our challenges. So there are a few rules for the day. So keep calm, follow the rules. I'm going to get you to generate lots and lots of ideas today, lots and lots. And one of the things, I've already talked about using the phrase, how might we? One of the other things I'm going to ask you to say as, as you're going through that process of discussing ideas with your colleagues and your peers here, is to use the word and rather than but. Is there anything more deadening when you say, oh, I've got this really great idea, Let's do X, Y, Z, and someone says, oh, but that's not going to work. <laughs> it kind of stops you dead in your tracks, doesn't it? <laughs> Whereas if you say, oh, I've got this great idea, we're going to do X, Y, Z, and you say, oh, that's great, and how do you think we might fund it? Then it opens up that conversation and keeps it going. Very, very simple change <laughs> in the word, but a hugely impactful change in how you can generate ideas. I'm going to get you to, to generate lots of ideas today and, and we're going to look at those ideas and we're going to refine them and we're going to evaluate them, but I also want you to be able to let go of them. Sometimes we, we get quite obsessed by our ideas. I've come up with this really good idea. You know, no one seems to notice how good this idea is. Well, you know, maybe it's not that good idea. You know, maybe you just have to let it go. So just, you know, show them, but don't be too precious about it. What we're also going to do is really push this idea that more ideas are better. And often, again, um, I think it's a particularly Western cultural thing. It may not be true across all cultures. But as soon as you come up, it's like you've got to solve it quickly. So the best idea, yep, yeah, that sounds great, let's go for it. What I'm going to ask you to do today is not to stop, even if you think you've got a brilliant idea, to just keep going and going with the idea generation. I want you to stay focused. Try not to go off on too many tangents. You're probably going to meet people that you haven't met before. You might find some interesting things that you want to talk about. Can you save that for lunchtime and for social time? Today, let's focus on our idea solving. And listening. <clears throat> I was very interested to hear Kate when she was talking about trying to bridge the gap. And one of the things she said is, could we be listened to? And it's one of the things that we're, most of us are not very good at. Most of us 
I like here, um, you know, trying to, we're waiting for the gap in the conversation so that we can speak rather than actually listening to what the person is talking to us about. So uh, I assume we're going to be at tables, but we're not, we're in chairs and seats of wherever we are, but wherever you're talking to people, don't forget to listen. Allow people to speak and really try and make an effort to hear them. And I think we're going to be using post-it notes and all sorts of things and I want you to try and draw things as much as possible because visualising things is also a really good way to approach the problem solving rather than always using words. Be respectful of each other. We're all different and we're all equal. And hopefully we're also going to have a bit of fun along the way as well. Okay, so we're going to create some ideas, but before we uh, get into the hardcore part of looking at the problem of how to improve engagement between uh, international and domestic students, which we'll start to do after the tea break, we're going to have a, an idea walking, warming up session, which we can uh, manage before the break. So. All right. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do is to work in either pairs or three people. And I'm going to give you an ordinary, everyday object. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to give you five minutes, and I'm going to ask you to come up with at least ten, if not more, uses for that object, other than for which it was actually intended. So the object I'm going to give you is this. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do in a moment is, looking at that chair, I want you to come up with at least 10, but as many as you possibly can, uses for the chair that don't include sitting. today. <laughs> <laughs> So there are kind of three phases generally to the human-centred design thinking process, and that's inspiration, ideation, and iteration. So it's this kind of circular process, and we're going to go through some of those today. I'm going to give you some examples of um, uh, ideas of human-centred design, and one of those is Kellogg's cornflakes. Would any of you have expected Kellogg's cornflakes to have been an example of human-centred design? Um, Kellogg's Cornflakes was developed by a man called Dr. Kellogg and his brother ran a nursing home and one of the problems that his brother was experiencing in the nursing home was finding uh, food of nutritional quality that the elderly could eat, many of whom didn't have teeth or had difficulty chewing or uh, you know, absorbing food. And so he experimented with finding something that would be appealing, that would have some taste to it, but that would be very easy for people to eat, that would have a high nutritional value. So it was human-centred design because he didn't originate it thinking, how can I make a cereal that will make me lots of money? He thought about, how can I provide uh, nutritionally valuable food that will help the elderly get the nutrition that they need in an easy and palatable way? The Open University, which some of you may be familiar with, that, that university that anyone can enrol in anywhere in the world and do online, was again uh, looking at the opportunities that it could present for people who aren't able to come onto a campus like we are here today, or able to participate full time, but still want access to knowledge and to gain qualifications. Uber, the taxi service, which is uh, highly controversial in Melbourne, I don't know how it is in the cities where you live, but in Melbourne it's really causing havoc there. And Uber was designed about meeting the needs of the users of the cars more effectively. So they looked at it from that perspective. How can we, you know, so many people complain about taxis, so many people are not happy travelling in a taxi that they need to have access to someone else being able to provide them with transportation, and they came up with a design for Uber highly successful, again, causing all sorts of problems because it's, it's challenging the normal ways of doing things through providing the service that for people is exactly what they want. And Airbnb, who's, who's heard of or used Airbnb? Yeah, great, a few people. 
Now when Airbnb started, they had this idea of couch surfing and of creating this couch surfing service. And everyone said they were completely bonkers because who in the world was going to open up their house to strangers and rent out their couch? Well, they were wrong. <laughs> there were lots of people who were more than happy to do that. And Airbnb has again become this amazing worldwide phenomenon that is offering accommodation in people's private homes um, and challenging the conventional ways of, of finding accommodation when you're travelling. Airbnb is now my much preferred uh, way of travelling. And one of the things I love about it is when I go somewhere, a, a new country that I've never been before, I often meet my host, who's a local person, who's very happy to take the time to tell me about the sorts of things that I might find interesting that only a local knows about. Uh, someone who is very happy to give me some information tailored on my specific interests. And it's not uh, a concierge in a hotel who's going to try and sell me a, uh, you know, a package deal to something that he gets more kickback from. So these sorts of things are really powerful examples of how designing from the needs of the user or the people who, or who it's attracting are really come up with some really amazing results. Um, empathy. Um, I don't know if you find this joke funny, I do. If you've ever been in a hospital and you've had to wear one of those terrible gowns, you'll know what they're talking about here. Um, so it's again about developing empathy. It's about understanding what the person who's experiencing that difficulty might be experiencing. It's about designing specifically for their needs, not to meet what you think are their standard requirements. It's about that listening again, about that deep understanding. And if I could just share a little story here, I was lucky enough to spend some time in Mexico and I was working there in one of the co-sharing workspaces with a group of uh, a lot of young people who were there um, <clears throat> working for NGOs and I was in a, uh, an area called Oaxaca in the um, southwest of Mexico, uh, quite a poor region. And uh, one of the young men who was, was starting up a social enterprise came in one day really upset and quite frankly, to use the Australian vernacular, pissed off because he had worked really hard with his patrons to, to gather a whole lot of money to build toilets in a village that didn't have toilets. And when he went to the village collective and said, I've got this money, um, I'm able to build you some toilets, they weren't impressed. They kind of went, oh, okay. Uh, well, you know, really, we don't really want toilets, but we'd really love to have a fiesta. We'd love to have a party. <laughs> and the, the guy was completely appalled by this because you know, here he was, he'd found his money, he was offering it to build toilets, and the people were saying, we'd rather have a party. Well, he hadn't listened to those people. He hadn't worked with them. He hadn't got to the point of understanding with them so that he might be able to explain to them the enormous benefits of having, you know, hygienic sanitary conditions and how that might reduce a whole lot of problems that the, the community was having. Um, so that when he offered it to them, they, they didn't want it. Um, and I think there are lots of examples like that. So I think it takes longer, <coughs> it's slower, <coughs> and sometimes we don't always hear what we want to hear, but that listening to understand is vitally important. <coughs> You also need an optimistic outlook. You have to believe in the positive power of people. You have to believe that change is possible. You have to believe that innately people want what's best for themselves and for their families and to work with them on that. If you go in with a negative framework to any sort of situation, you're not going to come up with good results. You also need to embrace ambiguity because things aren't always clear. And often that's a very uncomfortable place to be when we're not sure of what, what's actually going on. That guy, for instance, that day, he was really in that place of ambiguity. I'm offering toilets and they're asking for a party. Where do I go from here? You know, um, how do I work with that? And that's not a comfortable place to be. We, we like to have certainty. We like to have black and white answers. 
we in Australia, we're living, we're dwelling in ambiguity at the moment. We have no clear government. It's, it's an annual look at the anxiety that it's creating around the place. People are kind of really anxious, like, what are we going to do? Well, guess what? The sky's not falling in. You know, the country's still ticking over. It's not the end of the world. And we'll sort it out. Um, and learning to live in that place is really important. And understanding that we are going to be living with uncertainty particularly as I, I, as I referenced earlier, going into the future with the amount of technological and social change that's happening, we don't have a clear pathway for the future. We don't know. So we just have to live with that. We have to work with that. One of the big things that really is pushed in uh, the human-centred learning, um, design thinking approach and social innovation is not fearing failure. And I, you know, I have a confession here. I often thought that everybody else's success path looked like that straight arrow. You know, everyone else seemed to be just kind of going that way, and I was really on around those loops. But the secret is everybody's going around in those loops. You know, that the pathway to success is not clear, it's not direct. There'll be many slips on the way, there'll be many dead ends that we end up exploring and thinking we've wasted our time, but nothing is wasted, we're all learning something all the time. And one of the things I think, particularly in Australia, we're really frightened of failure. We see that as a really bad thing. And often uh, when I go to the States, and as it was mentioned, we're, we're members of, um, CQU's members of a, a, an organisation called Ashoka U. Um, of those 35 other universities, about 30 of them are American universities. And when I go along to their conferences and their exchanges, I'm so impressed by the way in which, particularly in America, as much as you can generalise about these things, but there's an acceptance of failure. It's like, I've started a business, I've started five businesses and I've failed four times. Yay, I'm getting somewhere, you know? Um, <laughs> what is a fail is first attempt in learning, um, but I think sometimes we lose, lose track of that. Now, I'm aware that we're coming up to um, our morning break time, tea time, so I'd like to leave that there, and when we come back after the break, we're going to get into teams, and we're going to start to put this into action and problem solve. So thank you, and I'll see you next week.